Where I lived, they believed that deaf people can't do anything, so it was very, very difficult. I came to RIT because of the communication. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Yeah? <clears throat> Great. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for, for coming and, and joining us. Um, welcome to IGF Workshop 172, which is um, titled Accessibility Improved. Building Inclusive Societies with Artificial Intelligence. How many, for how many of you is this not the first session on AI at the IGF? Okay, great, so majority of you, this is the first AI session, perfect. Um, the session is organized by the International Chamber of Commerce, Business Action to Support the Information Society, uh, the Association for Accessibility and Equality of Kenya, and also the Latin America Internet Association in um, Uruguay. Um, so my name is Carolyn Nguyen, and I'm the Director of Technology Policy at Microsoft. I'll be moderating the, the session today. Um, welcome, I'm really excited to be here today to discuss with all of you about how AI can be used to address accessibility and inclusiveness. And um, so what do we mean by that? Um, it's very much about how artificial intelligence can empower everyone uh, regardless of age, ability, or language. And by how? By creating new opportunities that had not been available to, available to them before, um, either socially in terms of enabling these people to be better integrated into societies, and or professionally by um, being able to integrate them better into the workforce. So why is this important? Well, it's important because overall, um, there's about a billion people, or 15% of the world's population, have some form of disability, and 80% of them live in a developing world. And there's a growing demand for accessibility uh, by people with disabilities or impairment, and this trend will continue to grow faster due to the aging demographics. So for example, in the US with the aging of the baby boomers. So um, let's start with the basic. Uh, I just want all of us to get to the same level on what is AI, and I'll define it very quickly as a set of technologies that can help to improve the ways in which machines interpret the world around them. So these exact same capabilities can be used to help people with disabilities to interact more naturally with the world around them by reducing barriers for them in both professional and social settings uh, by creating new opportunities for them and helping them to realize their full potential. So what I'm going to do is um, start today by um, taking a look at these two videos as examples of some of these capabilities and then I'll introduce the, the panel. Um, we'll go ahead and, and play the video. Okay. 
So the first one is a set of capabilities that was developed by Amazon. My son is 16 years old. He has autism, severe autism, and he's not able to communicate. As a technologist, I have always been looking for different ways to help him communicate. So he can speak certain words and phrases, and he can read and write, but he can't hold a conversation with you. And the idea behind Plexi was to help build technology that could help him and others with dementia or other special needs to give them that confidence to, to not have to have someone constantly in their space monitoring them, but sort of an invisible assistant that lets them have that freedom and sense of confidence to live their day to day lives. Plexi is connected to a speaker in his room as well as some lights and some buttons. Good evening, Calvin. It's time to get ready for bed. And the lights let him know that there's a message that's speaking and the button is a way for us to confirm that he's actually listening to the message. Please push the button. Typically with people with autism, they, they love routine and they work best on routine. Good morning, Galvin. It's time to brush your teeth. Okay, now brush your teeth. And so it gives him a calm, consistent, communication on a regular basis and so it has been a great tool to to give him some sense of consistency which is very important for people with autism. The fact that we have this technology now in Lex and Polly and Alexa and there's so much momentum behind it at Amazon that provides that support to be able to build a tool like this. I feel encouraged and empowered to actually build this, uh, to build a tool like this for my son. And it's very fulfilling because this may be, this is the, the tool that will reach out to him and break through. Great, and then we have another video, and this is from Microsoft. Where I lived, they believe that deaf people can't do anything. So it was very, very difficult. I came to RIT because of the communication access that's provided here. RIT has nine different colleges. And NTID, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, is one of those nine colleges. We are the world's largest mainstream program for deaf and hard of hearing people. We have the world's largest interpreting services, as well as the captioning group. It's the largest, yeah. Yeah. but we still you? cannot keep up with the growth and the need for access services. So we decided to use Microsoft Translator as an additional communication yeah. tool, which can help name? RIT on its journey to scale. So Microsoft Translator but uses AI to provide another really strong bridge for the That's gap that has been there so long. As a deaf person, I want the exact same information that my hearing friends have. Presentation Translator was easier than we thought it would be. You really just have to click it, and the software automatically reads the content and everything that you have within the PowerPoint system. The Cognitive Services Custom Speech Recognition is critical for capturing vocabulary words that wouldn't be necessarily conventional in everyday life. Students can pick any language that they choose to receive the information. If the professor has chosen English, which they speak, then I can choose whatever language I learn in best. Do you guys play any video games? Students can use the app to initiate a conversation with others. So now that I have my phone, I can see exactly what was said. <laughs> there are barriers to communication everywhere, but I think it's time we look at the barriers as opportunities, and then they can be broken down. Microsoft Translator has the ability to provide opportunities to reach out to everyone. Great, thank you, Sharada. And um, that was a technology that I was actually going to demo f um, for you so that we could run the, the session live. So in you're going to be interviewed over Skype, and you want to look better than this. Well, here are four easy keys that you can apply. Sorry, but um, we have a little bit of a network issue because all of that stuff is actually um, running live uh, off the network. So I, unfortunately, I couldn't do it. Um, but um, anyway, so, so what, another thing I'd like to put out there for everyone to consider is that um, all of the 170 plus countries that have signed or ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities 
are required to put policies and practices in place. So what I'm hoping is that we can use this conversation here to um, have a, di a dialogue and um, explore how some of these technologies can be used to implement and increase access and improve accessibility for everyone, including, for example, one of the things that we started looking at is um, overcome barriers in access to justice, and I'll come back to that as part of our dialogue. Um, so in terms of the session structure, we'll do it as um, there will be two segments. The first segment will be expert interventions from our speakers here, and I'll introduce them shortly, on both technology and policy. And then the second session is very much about an interaction with the uh, speakers and everyone. And to help us run all of this, because um, um, we always need that, uh, the remote moderator is uh, Sharada Srinivasan, um, and also Laila El Kadiri. I'm sorry, I hope I got that. <laughs> and our rapporteur is um, Sophie Tomlinson here. Thank you so much. And um, I'll in go ahead and introduce our panel now. Uh, to my left, all the way left, is um, Gonzalo Navarro, who is from the Latin American Internet Association, um, the executive director. Next to um, Gonzalo is um, uh, Nobu Nishigata, who's an economist, policy analyst, and um, leading the, the work, um, part of the team that's leading the AI work at the OECD. And then to my right, I have um, Chris Wilson, who's the senior manager at public policy at Amazon. And then um, Ms. Olga Cavalli, who is the advisor of Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Argentina. Do we have the other speakers remote? No. Okay, perfect. Um, well, we have some remote speakers um, who may join us as the conversation goes along. So let's go ahead and start. We'll go ahead and start with um, uh, Nobu. So uh, can you share with us, you know, sort of what are the findings of the OECD analysis and initiative on AI? Just the tremendous, like a sliver of the tremendous work that you've been doing. Uh, so do we have the slides up there? Um, hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Nobu Nishigata, and thank you for uh, the invitation to the IGF. And I'm very honored to, and also the flattered <laughs> by the introduction of the call line. But uh, today, Okay, I just start. <laughs> Sorry for the troubles, but uh, actually, we started the work on artificial intelligence in 2016 in the OECD. Uh, actually, it's after the G7 meeting at this year uh, that hosted mm -hmm. in Japanese government uh, at that year. Japan takes the presidency of the G7 meeting. And we had a meeting at the Takamatsu uh, in Japan, and we, where the, the, the G7 leaders get together and then started a talk on the artificial intelligence in the future. Then uh, we had a couple events, and particularly, like we had a huge conference. Uh, we had uh, Caroline as a speaker, one of them, but it's a 2017, last year, October. And then we had a joint workshop here in the IGF last year in Geneva. And then uh, now we are going to do the current work is one of the biggest work is uh, analytical report. We are uh, developing the uh, whole uh, analytical report on artificial intelligence and it covers policy issues and the technological development and the application in the other industries. And then the other thing is we are now working on the de oops, development of the principles, uh, which will foster the trust. Uh, here you go. It's, uh, I'm talking about the ongoing number two. Oh, the, the back one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we had just uh, started work on an export group, uh, which will develop the principles about the artificial intelligence, which will foster trust and adoption in the society. 
then uh, it's just introduction for the next year planning we are going to develop an observatory and uh, the, which will also the enhance the, the, uh, the, the adoption and the trust in uh, societies the next slide please uh, next slide please and uh, I just introduced a couple of findings in our report today then which is not declassified yet, sorry about this, but uh, we, are going to have, we, we are going to talk our report tomorrow, <laughs> actually, in uh, the committee of the OECD. So just an introduction, a couple of things. Uh, the, one of the biggest uh, trend in the investment to the artificial intelligence is the investment to the startups, and, uh, or I would say the small company, venture capitals, and those kind of things. And it's very, very rapidly growing, as you can see. And the other thing is some uh, location, United States and China is very active in this investment. And the next slide, please. And the other finding is we try to identify the application of the artificial intelligence. And uh, regarding the topic of this session, then, then I just would like to mention about the some techniques, uh, the combination between the art artificial intelligence and the argument reality, or maybe if you are familiar with that, uh, it, as well as a mixed reality, it's a, it's a kind of advancement of the technology with that argument reality. I mean, if you are not familiar with that, uh, you can, s maybe you know about the Pokemon Go, uh, the, you can see the monsters in this. Then, then you, you can, com uh, with the combination with the artificial in intelligence, which enhance the like of recognition of the images or like uh, voices and sounds, then, then this combination will enhance uh, the access to the surrounding environment so that the, like uh, Microsoft is uh, one of the leading company, I recognize that the development of these technology to, for the handicapped people. So that the, like if you see the glasses with the, these techniques, then, then like uh, even if you are blind, the, the, the glass is gonna tell you what is around you, or like if you see the menu, if in a restaurant, then, then the, the grass is gonna tell you that what's on the menu, so that you can choose, then you can order those kind of things. And the uh, next slide, please. And uh, just introduction of our work on the policy development in the OECD. Uh, we developed uh, the framework, and it says a seven portion. Uh, that studying the access use, particularly for the use, maybe like its application even uh, for the handicapped people. And innovation, we need innovation to, to put forward and uh, proceed the, the technology use. And of jobs, of course, uh, some people may know it, but uh, AI is gonna replace you in a job working place <laughs> sometimes. And uh, we are not very sure how, how fast that, that that's gonna come, but uh, if you, uh, we, we have one report just to introduce that uh, like uh, long distance truck drivers, it's very sus susceptible to the, these challenges and uh, maybe in that area, we have to develop some policies in, in each countries to, for, for the uh, professional drivers to get the new skills uh, or just adjustment to the new technologies. Otherwise, uh, once we have the, the driverless trucks, then, then the, the, the huge change is gonna happen. Then the, the other thing, just uh, kinda, we just analyzed the landscape of the policies. That the, the main finding is right now, like more than a 20, what I would say 25 uh, countries uh, already made uh, AI strategies for their nation or uh, developing uh, national strategy how to cope with AI. And uh, on the other hand, the uh, international uh, fora, like G7 started the discussion in the 2016 and they just continued the discussion and the, after the G7 meeting at the Shubelbo, Shubelbo, sorry, Shubelbo and the summit uh, meeting, and then, then they adopted the document for the artificial intelligence in the society. Then, then G20, that Japan is going to take the presidency next year for the G20 meeting, and then uh, we are hoping that they are going to proceed some discussion about artificial intelligence in depth. And um, 
for the United Nations, like uh, IGF is of course the one, but on the other hand, UNESCO started a discussion about uh, AI with the ethics. And uh, on top of this, like a non-governmental organization, just among them is IEEE or like a partnership on AI. There is a run by the, like including Microsoft, Amazon, and then Facebook and Google and other uh, academic people like the Future Society or Future of Life. Uh, Future of Life adopted the Asiloma principles for the AI. Uh, so that's, we have a bunch of uh, initiatives and the policy leading the papers about artificial intelligence. So the OECD is just uh, analyzing these papers and uh, starting the working on the development of the policy framework, how to cope with the artificial intelligence and the technological distortion could be in the future. Then the last slide is just the introduction of the observatory. This is the work uh, starting next year. So we want to be the, uh, we want to create the single windows because there are so many departments in the just for the example, talking about the government in, in every country, like many, many departments are working on artificial intelligence in some ex extent, so that uh, we want to create a single window to start a discussion and uh, exchanging information and exchanging best practice among the world. And uh, we are just going to keep taking the stocks and the development of the policies and other initiatives and artificial intelligence. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, just introduction of our homepage. It's very simple, OECD and an AI. And this introduced our work on an AI so far. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Nobu. And um, I think it's really fantastic that actually in the work that the OECD is doing uh, to develop AI um, guiding guidelines or guiding principles, I would say that the first principle is actually inclusive and well-being. So it's already very much built into the, the works. It's really, really nice to, to see this built in. And um, one of the things that, that I'd like to explore sort of in the next section is, so um, how can we build that into the, the various different AI national strategies? But um, so next up, I'd like to invite um, Gonzalo um, to talk a little bit about um, what steps can business take to improve um, accessibility for, for people with disabilities and some examples. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to be in this panel. I'm really excited about this opportunity because obviously <clears throat> we are talking about a um, an relevant topic for the future of our uh, humankind. Uh, the, straight, the more straightforward answer to your question, I think that we need to do a lot in the future and the present. Um, fortunately, I, I think that the, the private sector is responding uh, to this talent uh, in the way of creating new technologies, devices, and services for people with some kind of disabilities. And this is a crucial element because you were mentioning at the beginning of the, your presentation, Carolyn, that probably we have one billion people living uh, with some kind of disabilities. And 80% uh, of that one billion people lives in undeveloping parts of the world. And Latin America, obviously, is one of them. So uh, we are talking about an, a, a crucial element here. So what we can do? Well, some companies have started special programs designed to bring accessibility to people with some disabilities. Uh, some of them are creating special services and products able to, to do the things that you saw at the video, which is important. And most importantly, I think that the private sector or the business community, at least in Latin America, or companies providing services in Latin America are aware about these necessities and the potential that uh, they have you know, for um, create better uh, living conditions for the people. So from our side, what we are doing in Latin America is conducting a research on how technology is going to have an impact in the laboral force in the future. Uh, that report is going to be prepared by March next year. And 
we are creating or inserting a special, a special section about artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence is going to improve the conditions of accessibility and laboral force in Latin America. It's a key element uh, that is going to reshape probably uh, most of the um, gaps that we have in Latin America. Obviously, we have uh, still a pending gap, which is accessibility to new technologies, but the technology is there, is ready and, uh, and prepared to bring enhancement for, for the people. So that's the thing that we are doing, and we are happy to share more about this in, um, in some minutes, uh, minutes uh, when we can talk with the audience and about this uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Gonzalo. Um, that's a, a really, really rich area in terms of exploring uh, the, the potential uh, use of AI in, in the workforce, in particular to increase accessibility. Um, so I'd love to come back to that during the, the Q&A session. Uh, so, so next we'd like to really turn to our next two speakers, really to talk a little bit more about um, what how can some of these challenges be addressed through the policy questions and what's an enabling policy environment to uh, encourage development of these types of technologies for accessibility? Um, Olga, if I may, I'd like to ask you to um, address and share your thoughts on sure. what policy principles um, can be put in place to encourage development um, of these kinds of technologies and also to capture the, the benefits that they can bring. For pe to empower people um, with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation. Um, as, as you were rightly mentioning at the beginning of the session, with 80% of the disabled people living in the developing world, you can imagine how challenging is this for, for developing countries. Uh, the problem with using technology, and I was in another workshop uh, this morning about smart cities, and I had the same idea in mind. The priorities that our governments have, unfortunately, I focus in more urgent things. So sometimes the, the issue about smart cities or using technology for disabilities is, is not that it's not important, but sometimes lag behind a long list of other immediate uh, problems that we may have. Argentina has a 30 percent of the population under the poverty line and they are not disabled people, they are normal people that cannot perhaps reach uh, food or uh, work. So that is a big challenge. So um, at a national level, we have uh, some regulations in at Argentina. We have some regulations mainly focused in the possibility that people have access, people with disabilities have access to, for example, health, education, mobility in, in buildings and transportation and all that. In regards with technology, with the use of technology, we had some projects that uh, the problem is that you have this disability in mind when you design the tools, when you design the technology. If you don't have that in mind, sometimes, and it's it's not an issue of perhaps not not caring for disabled disabled people. It's just not having that in mind at the moment that you design the tool. So, um, and perhaps with the government and with some uh, non-for-profit organizations, we have been trying to uh, promote that when a web designer is designing a website, have those um, rules in mind, so perhaps blind people or people with sight disabilities can have access to that information. Um, I would like to share with you a, a very interesting project that is, uh, it is this moment or maybe later? Uh, so, um, there is um, a very, um, I, I care for it very much, and this is, uh, we have helped them from our non-for-profit activities in the Internet Society Argentina chapter, and here is my colleague Adrian, we have helped them a lot. There is a, a library for the blind. They, um, they digitize, they make the audible books with normal books, we have some machines. They are a group of blind or with low sight people. They, they, they built an NGO. And they have, um, they have in their library more than 50, 56,000 books in Spanish. And they're adding more books to their library in other languages, including Portuguese, English, and German. Uh, the beauty of the project is that they told us that only 
they don't have exact statistics, but they think that only 2% of the blind people know how to use this technology to read. Imagine someone that cannot see uh, accessing 56,000 books. The, the life of these people could change dramatically. Also, printing books in, in Braille, Braille you say in English? Braille? It's extremely expensive, and the books are huge, difficult to, to carry from one place to the other one. So this technology, this platform can be used by anyone having a computer and some tools installed in the computer. But what they told us is that only 2%, they think that only 2% of the blind or sight disabled people can know how to use. And it's not so difficult, but it's not trivial. So you need some, some um, education to uh, some some time with them to to understand how to use the tool so what they have been doing and they have received many prizes also from unesco and we have helped them in finding uh, funds from from internet society and other sources of funding they create um, teaching places for the blind people so they can go there with their computers and they get to know how to use the tool so perhaps in in some hours they know how to use and they know how to access all this books and, and they have built this in not only in Buenos Aires where they have their main headquarters but also in cities around Argentina and they have started to do that in cities around Latin America so and that is that is not not funded by by the by the government it's just their their ideas and going around and I will finish with this comment which I think is really relevant they had problems with uh, intellectual property laws at the point there was someone coming and said, hey, you are copying and distributing content which is not allowed. So they started a work that ended with an international treaty. It's called the Marrakesh Treaty that allows this content to be used for humanitarian reasons or for disabled people. So they have the right to use those contents for people that are blind or they have problems, not only blind, imagine old people that maybe uh, cannot hold a book or their sight is, they're not blind but, but, but they cannot see well, or people that cannot even move, maybe it's easier to hear a book, an audio book, than reading a book. So the, imagine that they started with this, with this idea and they ended up building this international treaty that is, has a huge impact in the whole humanity having this kind of disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, that really, really inspiring example. I think um, you, and, and also for set. Yes. Just, just to know, uh, the, the, the project is called Tiflo Libros. I can send you the link. It's a very nice website with all the books. A anyone can access them, by the way. It's not only blind people. Th that would be great. I think that you've set up a really great example there. Um, you know, a couple of things that, that you've put out there is, is really great for everyone to think about, which is diversity by design. Um, I mean, accessibility and diversity by design or inclusiveness by design is something that you put out there. I think the other thing that you've made very clear is that when we start to think about, you know, sort of accessibility and these kinds of policies, it is part of an overall holistic policy framework because what I'm hearing from you almost is a, clear, um, a verification and affirma affirmation of the, of the um, policy framework that Nobu put up, which says that you have to have accessibility in terms of being able to access the services, the capacity building, the equipment, et cetera, but also intellectual property. And also you set Chris up really nicely with audibles and also um, you know, with the value of partnerships. So, so Chris, if I can ask you to, to talk about um, you know, how, what kind and how partnerships can help to enable these types of applications to mo motivate them. And also, um, if you can um, you know, talk about what steps are needed to ensure investment in, in some of these kinds of um, capabilities and applications as well. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Carolyn. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really, it is a, a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about uh, Amazon's efforts on AI and specifically Amazon's efforts on AI and accessibility. I, I must admit, I, I'm a bit torn. Uh, uh, we've obviously each given just a few minutes to talk about this initially. And on one hand, I don't know what I can say that's, that improves upon the videos you saw, because I think that's the real world tangible experiences speak much more loudly than anything I could perhaps say. On the other hand, um, because AI and accessibility is so important to 
Amazon, I could probably spend the next two hours talking about, about what we do and, and our efforts. But So I will find a happy medium and just speak for a couple of minutes uh, to you um, about, about our efforts. I think it, perhaps before we get into the, some of the policy thinking um, and, and, and investment thinking, I just want to maybe lay out a little bit how Amazon approaches uh, uh, AI and accessibility uh, specifically. And I think it touches a little bit of what, what Olga uh, talked about in terms of accessibility by design. So our mantra at, at Amazon is uh, number one, focus on the customer. And we always work backwards from there. Everything we do, whether it's AI related or not, is focused on what is good for our customer. Does this improve the customer's access to goods and services? Does this improve the customer's lives? Does it make their lives easier? And uh, that is certainly true with regard to accessibility um, uh, matters. Every day at Amazon, as we call it, every day is day one. Um, and we're constantly thinking about how we can innovate and improve upon products we already have in the pipeline and then products we think about in the future. And to be sure, that means we're obviously always learning from mistakes. Um, we, you know, we make mistakes, and so we always are trying to iterate on that and see how we can, how we can improve upon that. And I think uh, you saw a, a, a taste of that with, with the Plexi project and how we can utilize Alexa uh, to improve um, uh, um, lives of those that have, in this case, autism, but other, other disabilities as well. Um, so again, we incorporate AI uh, into a variety of products and services at the company. Um, the most visible, obviously, for I think many in the room, if not all in the room, is, is our uh, Alexa product that we use through our Echo devices um, that um, we see as, a, as a, a, a true revolutionary opportunity for the company and for, for customers to, uh, to improve their lives and, have, and, and enjoy access to, to a variety of goods and services that they might not otherwise be able to access. Um, we, uh, at the company, we sort of see a bit of a continuum with AI and accessibility. On the one hand, we have AI uh, as a way to, again, to uh, facilitate access to services. And one example is something we have called VoiceView. VoiceView is a, um, a speech-to-text machine learning technology that we use with our Kindle devices and our Fire uh, tablets to allow uh, the blind to access um, uh, uh, material on their Kindle that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access uh, visually. Um, that's a real-world tangible example that I think dovetails nicely with, with the work that, that, that Olga was referencing. Um, and then we, you saw sort of in the, in the Plexi project where you have AI not as much accessing goods and services, but AI facilitating one, uh, someone's life and helping someone's, in someone's day-to-day -day life. Um, so we see, you know, at Amazon that there is definitely a continuum, and the work the work sort of uh, focuses on both sides of that of that uh, of that of that equation, if you will. Um, you know, I'll also speak briefly. You know, we through our Echo devices, we have AI technologies for the hard of hearing, for example. So tap uh, Alexa, tap to Alexa, which allows um, those that are hard deaf or hard of hearing to still use an Alexa device. In this particular instance, an Echo, Alexa, uh, an Echo Show device, um, and allow them to, to visually use, utilize Alexa where they couldn't necessarily hear and, and speak to, to, uh, to her. Um, so these are all examples of, of just small examples of how we, um, we incorporate um, all of our customers in our thinking, and certainly those disabled customers as well. Um, to get to your to, to Carolyn's questions and, and, and discussions about policy and partnerships, et cetera, um, it was mentioned I think earlier the partnership on AI as one gl glowing example of where industry and others, academics, et cetera, come together to develop, for lack of a better terminology, best practices and and and, and constructive thinking about about AI, not focused exclusively on accessibility, but that's certainly part of those discussions. And Amazon's a proud proud partner in that and proud engager in, in that, yeah, probably proud to engage in that and those efforts to, um, to I think, in, an, in part to hopefully um, uh, demystify a little bit uh, of, the, of the, the notion of what AI is and how AI helps people and, and, and debunk perhaps myths that may be out there about, um, about artificial intelligence. I mean, we see artificial intelligence as a, a technology or a set of technologies um, that should be, um, that should be embraced. Um, because I think there's there's far more positive and good that comes from them than 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 negative that you may that you frankly may hear about. So um, I think the more the industry and other interested parties can come together to talk about 
AI, educate people about AI, educate governments about AI, um, I think will go a long way towards um, providing that enabling environment for, uh, uh, to, to continue to innovate in, the, in this space. And I will say, you know, in terms of, you know, policy, et cetera, I mean, I know there's, as it was mentioned earlier, a lot of governments are uh, launching initiatives or have launched initiatives on AI and are looking at AI. Um, and I think uh, any discussion about policy for AI or any, any technology for that matter should sort of, it, it wants to focus on how can we enable AI, not how can we constrain AI or any other technology. And I think um, the more education that can be done, and as again, the more, the more industry and others can come together and work on best practices that can inform those discussions, I think will go a long way towards enabling innovate, further innovation um, uh, down the road. Great. Thanks, um, thanks so much, Chris, for, for that. And also, um, you know, for putting out there the importance, as we all think about AI, of really how AI can um, empower or augment, you know, human capabilities and create new opportunities, like what we're talking about here. Um, for, for this next portion of the, of the discussion, of the session, what I'd like to do is really just pose general questions to um, the, the speakers and actually anyone in, in the room as well. Um, I, I'd like to, you know, sort of have this, this part of the discussion in sort of three, four, um, three parts. The first one is I, I'd love to hear from, from our experts here as well as anyone else in the room in terms of, um, so we have some, we had some examples there in terms of how AI can be used to address um, outstanding, long-standing challenges for people with disability and create a more inclusive society. What are some of the other examples? What are some of the other long-standing challenges that AI can be used um, that, and, and can, be, can solve for people? Um, anyone? Sure, Sharna. <laughs> I actually don't speak. I actually don't speak with my One World Connected hat on right now, uh, but I do want to add uh, to some um, research on accessibility and AI that one of my friends, Radhika, who is not here in the room but in the IGF generally, is doing, um, which studies the use of artificial intelligence for healthcare access. Uh, specifically diabetes monitoring um, and and for making like and for uh, detecting diabetic glaucoma using uh, like eye technologies um, and she is currently working on a thesis on that so healthcare is one such area uh, that artificial intelligence is making a lot of inroads in and there are a lot of uh, questions of bias that uh, she is studying so you should all speak to her if you do come across her at some point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, about, uh, <laughs> about your comment about long-standing challenges, I think Chris mentioned something very important, that any regulation should see um, all these technologies, not only artificial intelligence, but in, uh, online technologies for disabled, uh, for normal people, uh, should, no, no regulation should constrain them. Um, and there, are, I know that there are uh, some concerns about um, um, privacy and, for example, those tools uh, and devices that Chris was uh, explaining a minute ago. Uh, some people uh, is afraid that this information is kept somewhere. So people are starting to also think not only benefits but also some, some problems with those technologies. So regulations should not be focused on those potential problems but focus on the benefits that they can bring to the whole people, the whole society, and especially for disabled people. So that, um, that should be clearly explained to regulators, uh, perhaps as uh, accessibility by design, information by design when they design the regulations. They have all the information so they can do the right decisions when designing the regulations and not, not constrain the, the good use of technology. Thank you, Thank you so much, Olga, for, for that. Um, yes, Gonzalo. Thank you very much. Let me add um, something um, on top of what all is saying because it's true. I mean, sorry, I okay. 
especially in our region, I mean, Latin America, uh, regulators tend to think uh, or try to regulate everything uh, because it's a common, under a common standard. So one thing that we put in place is that probably regulation is never, never, never go at the velocity that innovation is going. And the things and the good um, opportunities that we see in uh, artificial intelligence can be extended to basically any technology applying in, in, in the region. So that's why it's so important what Chris was mentioning in terms of public private uh, initiatives aiming to educate and to understand the boundaries and the benefits of the technology can bring. Uh, I was mentioning be before that, especially in Latin America, the laboral force is going to be impacted in a good way in terms of accessibility. Probably you know, uh, millions of people that are not able to go to their work or to, to, to perform um, in a regular manner uh, are going to be impacted in a, in a, in a good way. So, what we need to do is to work towards that common understanding on the benefits and not only to put an eye on the possible um, bad consequences of, of the use of technology and to bring uh, or allow platforms of any size to do what they do best, which is connect offer and demand. And here there is a huge opportunity I mean, for Latin America. Great, thank you so much, um, Gonzalo. On, on that note, in terms of partnerships, I can see that um, Susanna Lauren is on the line, is remote. Susanna, can you hear us? Can you speak? Not sure. No. Hello, Susanna? Mm -hmm. You're still on mute, so we can't hear you if you're speaking. So how do I continue? Okay. Um, Susanna, if you can hear us, if you... Hello? <laughs> If you are, um, if you can hear us, and if you'd like to make a comment, if you're able to type it into the chat window, um, we'll ask the, the remote moderator, either Sharada or Leila, to read out your comment. Okay, we'll we'll wait um, for Susanna to. Um, to come back to us on that. Um, so I, I want to take up this point in terms of um, regulation, principles, you know, et cetera, to encourage more the benefits of AI while acknowledging the risk. Um, Nobu, uh, I want to come back to you. Uh, so how, uh, in the work that you're doing in the AI initiative at the OECD, and in thinking about uh, crafting the principles, how do you think these um, points can be addressed um, and, and sort of the clarity in terms of, again, how can the benefits and the potential of AI be maximized but while making sure that the risks are acknowledged and mitigated? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, AI is going to provide the, the tremendous benefit for our lives in the near future, and already some of them already shown up. But uh, then some, uh, there were some issues on like uh, privacy. Of course, we do care about privacy, but before that, I, let me clear that, that OECD is not going to have any intention to regulate artificial intelligence, or no, uh, no intention to recommend member countries to do some regulation on artificial intelligence. Rather than we need more like innovations with the new technologies, like just you think uh, going back to the where we had the internet for the first time, like late 1990s. Like we, had, we saw the many changes and we are not sure how far uh, or how much impact AI is gonna bring us but uh, we just looking at that, this new technology in a different way though, but uh, they are going to bring that the huge impact on, and, and the huge improvement in our lives. And the, the, the handicapped people issue today it is one of the good examples, like uh, internet, of course, like we had uh, 
new implement in the accessibility to the internet for the blind people and the deaf people. But on the other hand, like this artificial technology is, I mean AI technology is going to work for your ear or like the work for your eyes. So then it's going to open up the new possibilities and which we didn't imagine. I mean, we, of course, we, we had expected, but now the expectation come true now. So in that sense, we want to have more uh, emphasis on the benefits or, like, a, I mean, good side. But on the other hand, like, if you just, uh, Caroline mentioned, uh, we had to think, like, uh, you know, the, the, like, if you think of the biotechnology, which is very uh, strong cutting edge technologies as well, you have to think, we have to be very cautious sometimes to treat with a new technology because like a new, the current biotechnology development opened up new possibilities to cure new, our diseases and then the preventive health care and those kind of things. But uh, I mean, you know, the technologies, we have to be careful sometimes. So in that sense, maybe a little, we started a little bit uh, the providing the cautions about uh, facing to the new technologies to the government as well. But uh, my point is that uh, we have to be cautious to the new technologies as well. I mean, you can tell by the histories of the development of the technologies, so the same way. But on the other hand, uh, we also want to put more emphasis on the beneficial side of the artificial intelligence. Sorry. <laughs> what I really like about the work that the OECD is doing is, let me get, um, read to you the objective of the work, right? Which is a predictable and stable policy environment that fosters trust in and adoption of AI globally is essential to enable AI innovation that realizes inclusive and sustainable growth and well-being. So you can see that the focus, that there's a recognition that trust is an issue and that there needs to be, um, and that the principles need to work together uh, to enable that trust. Hence, because only if there is trust can there be that broader adoption of the technology. Um, but it's important to, to Olga's point and Chris's point um, and Gonzalo's point as well that the objective of the principles is to realize um, inclusive and sustainable growth and, and well being. Um, Share that. You, so, yeah. There is a remote comment. I yes, please. To, uh, I just wanted to read out a remote comment. Just one second, if I can get the thing to scroll. Uh, my name is Eric Kofmel. I am with Autistic Minority International, and I am autistic myself. ITU and the World Health Organization have just set up a a focal group on AI for health. We have participated remotely in, and could you, uh, could I read from that one? Because it's, this one's reducing this problem. Uh -huh. um, yes, we have participated remotely in the uh, health track of the ITU's AI for Good Global Summit, and the first meeting of the focus groups and requested to be added to their mailing list to be kept informed on any initiatives and activities that, may plan with, uh, that they may plan with regard to autistic persons persons with disabilities in general, and or mental health. So far, we have not been added to the mailing list. What can we do to ensure that civil society and organizations of persons with disabilities are included in AI activities like the ITU slash WHO focus group? So thank you very much for that question. Um, although I can't address the particular ITU focus group, um, I can definitely say that there are multiple organizations um, that are looking at establishing best practices to develop technologies that would address health and also um, accessibility. Um, so for example, the, let me just give you some examples. The organization that Chris mentioned before, which is um, Partnership on AI, has a number of uh, civil society organizations as well as um, academics um, and um, industry um, from all over the world. Uh, right now there are more than 70 companies from uh, di pretty much different parts of the world. So there are, diff di there are different ways for you to get involved. And um, let us know, send us um, you know, an, an email, et cetera, and we're happy to incorporate you into uh, various different uh, discussions. 
And um, potentially, I'm, I'm looking at, are there any MAC members? X? X, X. X MAC members? <laughs> you are a MAC member, Gonzalo. Um, so, so maybe there's an opportunity to potentially create a, either a BPF or a DC potentially on, on, on this particular topic, right? AI for accessibility. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but, well, you know, this is a continuous effort because since I came into this environment, I mean, like, I don't want to mention how many years ago, but many years ago, the uh, <laughs> situation is not improving in terms of multilateralism. But obviously, the IGF was a tremendous contribution in that way because we are bringing different voices. And when you mention it, that what we need are a set of um, universal principles to be applied to in, uh, artificial intelligence is quite correct. I mean, that's the way we need to move. Um, I would I would like to say that perhaps you know the old vision about command and control set of regulations is not going to work, especially for artificial intelligence or the new kind of technologies that we are going to develop in the future. So common understanding and bringing different voices obviously enrich the, the dialogue and brings the set of, uh, of principles and thinking that we need uh, about this issue. And I think also uh, by participating in these kinds of sessions um, and being a part of the IGF platform, I think that's another way to participate and develop and increase awareness of these kinds of, of issues as well. Um, I want to come back to a point that Olga had made with respect to, um, you know, when you're starting to look at a policy environment that would enable and encourage accessibility by design, you brought up, um, you know, privacy, you also brought up intellectual property. So can you talk about how, what are some of the other elements that would need to also be there to create this kind of an enabling environment? You know, I hear also capacity building. Um, uh, Gonzalo, I hear from you also, um, you know, the need to focus on workforce issues. You know, Nobu, I hear from you, access, um, you know, et cetera. So maybe we can have a, a conversation around that. Thank you. I think for regulators, it's clear information, clear information about the benefits. Of course, they should be aware of potential uh, threats or problems that technology may bring, but that, that should be not in the first line of the document and, and focus on the benefits. But I, I always have the feeling that um, there's a lot of information of very important things that uh, the regulators and government officials don't have at hand at the moment that they have to make the decisions. So uh, they are so busy. They usually have so many things uh, on, on their table to, to care. And that, that's, again, the, the real challenge in developing economies, the, the list of urgencies is big and urgencies that impact the whole society. So that is challenging, but capture their attention with clear information and the clear benefit for the, some part of the society. And that can in, uh, let them know that that can change also what happens in, in, in other cities around and other countries around. What happens in countries in Latin America, it's clearly impacting other countries very quickly because of language, we share the same language, uh, Portuguese and Spanish are quite similar. So it's easy that, that this information spreads all over the region very quickly. So if they have this, these ideas in mind, clearly explained by technologists, I'm, a techno I'm an engineer, and sometimes we technologists are not so, <coughs> We go with technology, you explain it, and we are not so clear about benefits and clear concepts about how to target that easily and quickly. So that, I think, it's not only privacy, intellectual property, but have the right information to the right people at the right moment, right. which is not easy. Anyone else? Okay. There is a comment at the back. Yes. There's a comment. Um, hi, sorry. Can I ask you to come up to a mic so that the people at remote can also hear you?
Hi, uh, I'm Radhika. I uh, am doing my master's thesis on feminist perspectives on AI. So I just wanted to bring up, and I'm not sure if this was already discussed in the session, about uh, how um, gender biases come in so strongly when you design AI, especially when you don't think of it at the get-go from the planning stage, right? Like if you bring in someone towards the end as uh, someone who will just take a look at whether the system has certain, uh, you know, uh, effects or not, it isn't going to be very effective. So from the planning stage, you need to take a look at whether the algorithms that you're using are representing uh, in your data uh, all the populations that, you, that, that are going to be affected at the end of the day. And to really not think of technology as neutral because it does exacerbate the power equations that already exist in society. So if you're going to bring in an AI algorithm uh, that is going to make decisions, everyday life decisions for people, uh, those decisions are going to exist in existing power equations, in power dynamics, and a lot of social and cultural uh, dynamics that already exist. So, for example, a lot of the newer uh, t uh, algorithms that are coming up, such as uh, deep learning, uh, they are very efficient if you define efficiency as how much accuracy you want. But if you define it as how much of the algorithm are you really able to understand and are you really able to say how the algorithm came to that decision, then it's not the best option to use, right? Um, and it's these social implications of algorithms that really don't get spoken of much in uh, like technical groups. Uh, so I really think that that's also something that's important to discuss and keep in mind when, uh, when we're discussing AI and its uh, specific social implications. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, although uh, <laughs> I'm gonna call on her a little bit cold, Leila. Um, so so uh, to, to the point that you're making, so first of all, this conversation is very much about accessibility and using AI to enable, to address um, marginalized groups, right? Uh, the point that you're making, I, I wanna turn it towards disability, but I do wanna make sure to address it because you're making the point that technical people are not looking at bias. I would say um, there is a large research community uh, that is addressing this very, very question, and we have actually a researcher working on that in the room. I don't know if she wants to make a comment or not. Um, it, it's up to you. I, sure. Um, the, the comment was that the technical community is not aware of bias and is not addressing them. Okay, um, so, but um, Leila is, uh, so first of all, I'm sorry, this is Leila El Astri from Microsoft Research in Montreal, and she's a data scientist with our research organization. Um, as you're making the comment, if I can also ask you to uh, tilt it a little bit back towards the accessibility and inclusiveness conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, in the re within the research community, there is, um, there is a lot of concern about bias in uh, our AI models, and there is a lot of work on this and making sure that um, we build data sets and we train our models on data sets that are representative of everybody, and that includes um, groups uh, that need different um, technology for accessibility reasons. So uh, I can say that it's, a new topic, but it's a, an emerging topic for sure. And there is even a conference about this topic in particular. It's called Fairness, Accountability, Transparency. And it is sold out every year. It has been happening for uh, four or five years now, and it is sold out ev every year. That means that companies and researchers uh, in labs, in academia, and in companies are really concerned about this problem and really trying to um, make AI accessible to everybody. So there are technical solutions that are being proposed for these problems in particular. One is uh, data set collection, making sure that different groups are represented equally. And then also training our models so that they take into account uh, equality considerations so that our metrics are not only performance but also uh, fairness of treatment of different groups represented in the data. So uh, those are the, the, the approaches and uh, there is definitely a 
concern within the community and there, is def there are definitely best practices that are emerging and that everybody, I can say everybody in the community is really uh, applying those best practices and trying to reinforce them so that we make sure that our AI are accessible and usable by everybody. Great, thank you so much. Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Elina, I'm from the Dutch government. Um, it's really great to hear that this is happening, um, but I also have a question uh, for Chris regarding uh, Amazon. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining the panel. It's uh, great to hear that businesses uh, are as well really uh, concerned about these uh, topics rather than just NGOs and governments. Um, regarding the topic of uh, building inclusive societies, I was wondering uh, if and how Amazon tries to also include people um, who do not have the resources or the knowledge to use AI. Um, and the underlying question here is how do we prevent the increasingly growing divide between those with resources and those with, without resources uh, to use AI? Um, does Amazon see this as a responsibility um, that affects them as well? Or do you think uh, governments and NGOs need to step up here? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, great question. Um, I, I would say, so to, to the very last question, I would say it is a collaborative effort to so I mean, it's certainly uh, NGOs, it's certainly governments, uh, certainly the private sector has a responsibility to help um, <clears throat> uh, bridge that divide, if you will. Um, you know, to the extent, obviously Amazon's we have a wide ranging uh, lots of activities and initiatives, I think that, are, that touch on that. It'd be hard to sort of drill down on them right now. Um, uh, we do have a, uh, AWS specifically has uh, efforts uh, to try to uh, do some capacity building in various uh, parts of the world and communities to, uh, to help try to bring, to educate people and bring them up to speed, for lack of a better word, on, on the benefits of, of technologies. Um, like I said before, I think, you know, everything we do uh, starts with the customer and that's not a customer that's simply in a developed part of the world. It's sort of thinking about all potential customers all over the earth. Um, and we are, are, you know, our public mantra has been we're trying to be the most, Earth's most customer-centric company in the world. And that's, that includes everybody. So um, I'm happy to go talk to you maybe after, give you try to, or point you in the right direction for more specifics. But to suffice it to say, generally speaking, I think, and I, I think business writ large is always trying to, to uh, fill those gaps and help and collaboratively with, with governments and private sector, I mean, and NGOs and others, because um, it, is a, it is a team effort, not one entity has a role. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Kat Duffy with Internews, and I wanted to um, just let people know about a project that we've run that's been very focused on the inclusion of disabled and marginalized populations in the open source development of digital safety tools. It's a bit removed from AI, but the structures, I think, are the, there are potential sort of models that we've built that I think have been effective in this space and might be able to be scaled as well. Uh, so we have a site called usable.tools, which is available, and on that site we have numerous open source personas that have been developed for representatives of disabled and marginalized populations all over the world. So we'll have um, and like a blind LGBT rights activist, right? We have a disabled rights activist from Mexico as one of the user personas. So it's a, it's a wide blend, but over the years what we've realized is that it, it's not necessarily a lack of political will on the part of developers in terms of inclusion, but there are very vast gaps between the communities, and we don't have a lot of effective mechanisms for bringing the disabled communities or marginalized communities, especially high-risk communities, together with developers. So one of the ways that Internews has approached this is to do annual convenings where we, as an inter a trusted interlocutor, bring those groups together, and we bring multiple developers of multiple, multiple tools together with populations that represent high-risk or marginalized groups from around the world for multiple days or a week to really work together and talk to each other and begin to understand each other. And then for the open source community, we then also offer grants to the open source developers to iterate their tools based on the feedback that they received 
from those populations, which we found is a very important and powerful tool for developers who are coming in with fewer resources than your Microsofts and your Amazons uh, and, and the larger development community. So if that's of assistance to anyone, it is openly available. It's a project that we continue to run uh, and we'd be very happy to talk to anyone about it. And that's usable.tools. Great, thank you so much. That sounds like a really fantastic um, effort and, and project to bring you know all the different stakeholders together to have meaningful conversations. Um, yes. My name is Christian Boerman. Uh, I'm a software developer from the Netherlands, and we are talking about inclusion all the time here, which is truly great. Um, but w what could be the possible incentives for businesses to consider? people with uh, disabilities in their designs with AI, for example. Uh, one of the personal things, I believe, is that designing for people with disabilities also benefits uh, all other people. So it, 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 it benefits the company in the world and the product in the world. But are there any other possible incentives for companies? Thank, thank you uh, for that question. I mean, I, and I, not to sound like a broken record, but I think it gets back to, you know, from our perspective, Amazon's perspective, all customers are, are customers. Um, and we do not, it certainly does not benefit our, bo our, our bottom line to exclude significant portions of, of that customer base. And certainly those that with disabilities are an important part of our customer base. So, like I said, we, when we design products and services, we start with, um, you know, how, does this benefit the customer? How does this improve that, that customer's uh, uh, life? And how does that improve his or her access to, to what we're trying to provide them? Um, and and um, so you know, we mentioned, I think, the notion, this notion of accessibility by design. I think that's important, important to th think about because I think that's, that's certainly part of our thinking at, at, at Amazon. I assume you know, obviously the same is true at Microsoft. You, know, you think about these things from that, through that lens. And like I said, uh, we're, we're not perfect, and so we may miss the mark sometimes. Uh, certain technologies may not fit or fit for, for show at the time, but we always try to iterate on those and constantly are thinking about ways to, to improve upon those. So, um, you know, the incentive is there because we want to serve all customers. Simple as that, and we don't want to exclude anyone. And I'll add on to that as well, you know, from, from Microsoft's perspective. So our mission statement is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Uh, because we ha believe that everyone has value. And um, so accessibility is a pillar in everything we do. Every product that we make and we ship needs to have accessibility um, capabilities into it. And that's why you saw the, the development, for example, of the, essentially it's a PowerPoint plugin. And within the company, um, this is also a, we're actually um, <laughs> rated, you know, the, 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 the um, notion of performance, right? Um, that is a part of our work. So it's built into part of our work as well because everyone does have value. So the ability to bring in, um, to enable everyone to participate, we believe, enable us to build richer, products and as you said you know it's not just for people who are disabled it is a much better product for everyone um, and, and on that note so last year um, actually earlier this year uh, we launched a, a program called um, and it's part of our AI for good program um, and it's called AI for accessibility um, so the AI for good program is something like an 115 million dollar effort over five years and in terms of AI for accessibility it is about encouraging so to to the um, person from internews it is really very much putting a market out there that says accessibility is really important in inclusiveness is really important and so what we do is we encourage smaller organizations people anyone who either have a need or have an application um, to come in and apply for grants or to be able to use our resources to develop applications. It's the same thing for human rights. We also have an AI for human rights program and AI for earth programs. It's all the same kind of notion. Yes, please. Um, I'm Elif Sart. I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley. I think mine is more of a comment than a question. 
so inclusiveness also surely means including uh, how developing countries are using AI and how this affects their children, uh, their citizens. And one example of like how to use AI for good, what opportunities AI bring could be driven from India, how they use face recognition to spot 3,000 missing children by tracing them. And this is a great example of how it can be used. And as we also think of how normally systems, algorithms are trained by adult data, having this success on like finding children was, I think, great. And, uh, and also we have examples of US and China, how they're being extremely surveillance, using this surveillance for like with uh, face recognition. So what I wanted to conclude with is that uh, this really shows how much explicit and implicit human intention in creating and using algorithms matter, which I think we should keep in mind when thinking of inclusivity. Thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent point, and we completely agree. I, I would say, I think everyone on this panel would completely agree with you. Yes. Um, Karen Riley, I'm uh, a technologist. I don't uh, work on this issue specifically, but my community includes people with invisible disabilities. Um, and there's a gap in, in diagnosis with people with invisible disabilities. Uh, Asher Wolf, the founder of Crypto Parties, was recently diagnosed with an illness and is very vocal about the fact that it took, um, it takes on average 17 years for people with her particular disorder to get diagnosed because she gets dismissed, uh, particularly um, women and particularly women of color um, don't get diagnosed with these issues because doctors discriminate against them. So if anybody's working on this, I would love to see research on the language that, that doctors use to dismiss patients because we track um, when disabilities are diagnosed, but not necessarily when they're not diagnosed. Um, and to that point, people with disabilities are discriminated against in employment, which is one of the reasons why privacy is such an important thing to consider. Um, and why regulations do need to be considered from the outset. There are, there are potentially lots of benefits, um, but as a, when you're a person with a disability, you're already poked and prodded enough. You have to give up privacy enough. Um, so uploading things to the cloud in order to enable accessibility, um, that, that is a concern. Um, last point that I'd like to ask the companies. Giving grants is amazing, thank you, but how many people uh, with disabilities do you hire to work on these projects? Are all the people who work on these projects on a permanent basis neuro and biotypical? Um, are you hiring people with disabilities, not just to work on disability issues, but just to work as developers, as, as coders and all those things? Uh, well, excellent points. Uh, and I must admit, I, that's the first I've heard of the term invisible disability. So I, I, I can tell you right now, I've already been educated and that's hugely important to me and, and I think to the company. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have specific numbers or answers for you in terms of, of how we hire. I just, I can tell you that obviously we, we hire any and everyone that can contribute to the company and contribute to make a difference. And so uh, I, say, I can safely say that you know, we welcome all possible candidates, whether disabled or not. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not privy to the specific, our specific uh, uh, hiring practices, but I'm happy to try to um, find out information for you if, if that would be helpful. Great. Gonzalo. Thank you very much. Uh, in connection to your comments, uh, I think you're right. I mean, there, there, is, there are some aspects that are quite positive in terms of technology, and we, are, and we have other issues that we need to resolve in terms of privacy, for example. So the question here is how do you find the right balance in order to bring or allow the technology to be deployed and to protect the users and consumers at the, at, the, uh, at the same time. So I think that some standards are being developed worldwide and uh, we are still working on the implementation of that standard in some countries. So we need to wait and, and, and see uh, how they work, but obviously it's, it's, it's a matter of concern. Uh, regarding your second, that second part of your comment, 
Uh, I was mentioning that uh, perhaps in the future, or, or even in the present, uh, the inter, inter, in, uh, artificial intelligence are going to bring more spaces with people with disabilities. They are not going to uh, need to move, you know, into to, to the work or, or, or the job, or perhaps, you know, they are going to have their special uh, conditions, uh, even in, uh, in, in training, by the use of technology. And in many countries, you will have, or you have special laws in terms of uh, quotas or, or, or number of people that need to be hired in order to fulfill the law, I mean, uh, people with disability. And obviously, the use of technology is going to improve those records. So I don't have specific numbers, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the initial findings of our research, that the research that was mentioned at the beginning, is pointing in that direction. Great, thank you. Um, I'm look to, to answer your specific question on, on companies. Um, so we do hire, we, as, as Chris said, we hire everyone who's qualified. Um, and that's why we want to make sure that we develop technologies that can enable people um, who are some, you know, impaired to still participate. And, and that's a, a major effort you know, at, at our company. Um, I, I'm looking at the time, and what I'd like to do is to really go around a panel. Are there comments? Remote, sorry. Susanna, can you hear us? Okay, and uh, there's an, a comment from um, a remote participant. Uh, we believe, this is from Susanna Lauren, um, we believe partnerships are important in many ways. We work very close to end user organizations, public sector and academy, where we have the business perspective. I have tried, okay. Uh, and also in standardization, these, need, these sectors need to be participating for all important perspectives to be covered. Many talk about user-centric design, but often it is no more than first do most of the design and development work, then ask the users to test it if there is still time and money on the project. We might actually stay in something after the end users have given their inputs. Continue. Instead, we believe in really starting with and from the users, workshopping, discussing, etc., at the beginning of the project. At Funka, we are actively <coughs> recruiting people with disabilities. It is, a, it is a merit for working with us. And Susanna says she can still hear us. Unfortunately, we are unable to hear her. Thank you so much, Susanna, for that very insightful comment. Um, in the time that we have left, what I'd like to do is to ask every speaker um, to close, you know, to give a final remark. Um, and what I'd like you to do is one takeaway and also one call to action um, with regards to AI for accessibility. I'll start with you, Olga. Well, uh, I was thinking about that uh, usually in the developing world, we, the people who live there, are considered uh, consumers of technology and not developers of technology. And, and that's a fact that technology is mainly developed by companies which are not in our countries. Most of them are based in developed economies. So my, my comment for very important companies that are here, not so Gonzalo, uh, representing a group of, of companies uh, related with internet, is when, when they usually, the community, when a company from abroad comes to a developing economy, say, oh, they want to sell, they want us to consume technology. Well, you have to inform the community what you will be doing and use the opportunity to train local resources, perhaps build a regional development center, relate with local universities, not only with the government, and try to build knowledge at the local level. And, but tell that to the, to the community. If you don't express it, if you don't let the community know, people usually react um, negatively, and they, they only feel that the companies want to come and sell technology, which is okay for companies selling technology. But at the same time, if companies could partner local universities and, and governments to build local knowledge, 
that and explain that to the community, that would be great. So I think that, that it's, a, it's a comment from a user of technology in, in Argentina. Sorry. I That's a great point. Thank you, Olga. Chris? So I perhaps just build on that. I think so twofold. One, I think education um, about all technologies, but certainly AI and what it, what it means, how it can help improve people's lives is vitally important. I think certainly in the developing world, but even, even in the developed world, um, I think there's, there's always a need to, uh, uh, to educate not just governments, but, but all citizens about, about the benefits. And then just getting back to my, my point, I guess from, from an Amazon perspective, you know, I think <clears throat> when we, uh, quite literally, when we, when we conceptualize a product or service, we actually, put, we actually think of what the press release would look like first and then work backwards from there. And the notion is that if we can't articulate why this is good for the customer, why this helps them, him or her, then it's not worth pursuing. And that certainly is true with regard to, to, to accessibility issues and it's certainly true with how we utilize AI in, in all of our, uh, uh, our work streams. And so, uh, you know, working off of that, from that initial standpoint, I think helps us to be sensitive to concerns from uh, communities and others when we think about these products, whether we're launching them in specific markets or launching them globally. And I think that, you know, that would be uh, hopefully a takeaway from, 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 from this workshop is that I think industry, and certainly Amazon, I think approaches things that way, and we uh, take very seriously the impact technology has on people's lives. Um, and we want our customers to feel safe, secure, and trust, trust our, our, our products and services. So um, we don't take that, we never take that for granted, and we're always trying to improve on that, and, I, um, and hopefully we can continue to do so. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Nobu? Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me st first start about the partnerships. Like, uh, like we just talked about the AI technologies today, but if you think, like AI, just algorithm, it's just you can compare it you know, something in your brain, like a white tofu like type thing. It's programmed, you know. But uh, if you need a system to work to help, for example, as uh, the support the handicapped people, and then you have to something you have to get something like eyes, ears, or like something different devices, and these devices has to be combination and uh, with a good function too to make a solution like a just solution for the handicapped people, a solution for the food, solution for the disease, and those kind of everything. So, in that sense. The cutting edge technology is going faster to develop the new algorithm, somebody mentioned it. But on the other hand, we have to get the collective effort to make it to the solution for like for just think of the product more better food or like for the climate changes we face and the handicapped people assistance for robotics and those kind of things. So then, so my point is like, uh, the AI right now is more like a developing stage, at least. I mean, we still, even though we have the, like, more than 60 years in the history on the development of the study in artificial intelligence, but still, like technology just came here like, within years. So now maybe we, it's a time to think about the diffusion of the technology because the, in the beginning of the, this session, I like, introduced that uh, one billion people with a handicap waiting for the technologies. And before the AI comes, I don't think we had the technology, alternative technology or alternative device to support for the blind people with like this detail tells you about the surroundings or those kind of things. So then for the diffusion of the technology, then like even though like Microsoft, Amazon and the other companies are working and the leading uh, the diffusion of the new technologies in the good ways, but on the other hand, everybody has to be involved in the diffusion process of the technology. It's not only the company's job, it is not only the government job. We have to get the partnership in, in every stakeholder get together to make that solution. So, uh, somebody, uh, uh, the, the point uh, the, the raised the issue, the incentives to the company, like, uh, you know, I used to do work used to work at the Japanese government before I came here to the OECD. So I know some of them, like uh, the government 
will, I mean, government pays incentives to the companies who hire the disabled or handicapped people. It's a traditional way we still do that. We continue to do this, but on the other hand, we have to find a way, a different way, new way to enhance the, the empowerment of the handicapped people, then, then I think it's more like uh, not only the government effort, I mean every country, even Japan, has uh, the strong constraint in the finance. So, so maybe we have to create a better way to, to get the collective effort to empower our people, including us, even we are normal. So that's the, the point. And the other point just I want to make since this is the, the, I would say it's the Internet Government Forum, and I think to some extent we are familiar with some technology. So maybe it's time for the, everybody, each of us, start evangelizing the technology to the people who are not familiar with. Like for today's topic, like handicapped people, like a, they are very, very, uh, I would say, great people who takes care of the handicapped people around them. But on the other hand, I just found that they are not, in many cases, less familiar with the new technologies. So maybe each one of us can help understand the technology then so that they can think of the new, new use of the technology. Then it goes to that their community back, and then, then maybe new chemistry is going to take up then. Great. That's what I hope. Thank you, Nobu. Gonzalo? How many seconds do, we, do I have? <laughs> okay, 30. It's fine. Uh, no, it's, it's all right. So uh, let me take what Olga was mentioning because obviously we work in the same region. Um, actually, we work quite well you know, with the Argentinian government too. So I think that we, uh, we represent the platforms providing services and, and products in Latin America. And we take quite seriously uh, our role in terms of uh, dissemination of information and explaining all uh, the benefits and the, the cons, obviously, uh, coming from the technology. We see that we have a lot, a lot, a huge debate, you know, to work with governments and to explain and to work on details and, and national policies on this. Uh, next year, our focus is going to be uh, um, aimed to, to four points. One is artificial intelligence. The other one is cloud, because we need cloud, you know, to provide services through artificial intelligence. And on, on, on the issues of inclusion, inclusion, we have FinTech, which is an, a new set of technologies providing inclusion for the financial sector in our, in, in our region. And finally, we are going to be working on or thinking on the future of the work. And those elements are interconnected and it's part, a relevant part of our, our work. So I think that you are right, Olga. Uh, we, we have a lot of space to work on this. Awareness and creation of awareness is crucial. Uh, not only in Latin America, but in the rest of the world. And I take quite, uh, I, I think that's what quite interesting to, to be here today and to hear your experiences because it's super rich for our conversations in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Um, I'll do a, a quick wrap up. So, what I'm hearing very loudly is the need to uh, create awareness of the benefits and the potential of AI to create inclusive societies. And that awareness is not just technologists, it's company in terms of making sure that we are focused on enabling um, technologies that can help enrich people's lives and inclusiveness, but also to be able to build out that trust. But I'm also hearing that it's also important to create that awareness with the people who are impaired so that they do know that these technologies are out there as well that can enrich their lives as well as from government for the needs to um, provide incentives. So awareness, education, um, and that's absolutely critical in making sure that there is sufficient diffusion of the technology to enable the one billion people, um, the majority of which are in developing countries through uh, public-private partnerships through shared responsibility with all of the stakeholders at the table and also to make sure that there can be a holistic enabling environment um, to incentivize everyone to focus on this issue and in that holistic enabling environment we really need to be thinking about the social cultural impact and value, uh, the economic uh, impact and value as well as development of new technologies and what's the governance that can bring all of this together as well. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing your perspectives and insights. <laughs>